Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our webinar on applying to health professional school. We're going to provide a really brief overview of the application process for med school and dental school and pharmacy school and other health professional schools today. I'm going to go through my slides and then leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A, and I'll also identify uh, lots of other ways you can access our services remotely throughout the spring and summer if you're in the application process right now. My name is Dan Pooks. I'm a coach in the Career and Internship Center. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I specialize in helping students prepare and apply for health professional programs like med school and dental school. We work with students at every stage of their development process in terms of where they are and exploring their careers, whether that's uh, as fr incoming freshmen or as alumni, because we work with alumni all the time. If you've got questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A box. Like I said, I'm gonna to try to move through my slides quickly and leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. A couple of big takeaways when you're talking about the application process to these programs. The first takeaway is the process itself takes a really long time. It takes more than a year from when you start applying to when you would start one of these programs. And so many students will refer to that period of time as a gap year. Many students take additional years after graduation before they apply to get ready. And that may mean that they end up taking multiple gap years. That's increasingly common these days. But we want to emphasize to students that this process does take a rather long time and they should plan ahead. The other thing we want to emphasize to students is that this application process is extraordinarily expensive in addition to time consuming. And so we want to make sure that they only have to pay all of those fees one time. We also encourage them to take advantage of the fee assistance programs that the various application systems provide similar to applying for financial aid. And if you qualify, you get a number of discounts on the application materials as well as the test prep materials. Many schools will waive their secondary application fees. And so this award can save you several thousand dollars. So we always encourage students to apply for the fee assistance program uh, if they think that they would qualify. And then the last big sort of overall take on this, this upcoming application cycle is going to be extraordinarily different from a typical cycle because of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so medical schools are adjusting their application process and the cycle and the timelines and the requirements accordingly. And will continue to do so throughout the summer and throughout the fall. And so we're uh, trying to do our best at pushing out announcements that we get from the various application systems or from the various schools where our students are interested in applying. And we encourage students to also seek out updates directly from the schools and the associations because that's gonna be where they're gonna be getting the most up-to-date information. But I do wanna emphasize that my sense from talking to colleagues in health professional schools is that the, our colleagues at UW as well as at other schools around the country are gonna be extraordinarily accommodating and patient uh, throughout this process given that everything's probably gonna take a lot longer than it normally takes. So we're gonna go through the three parts of the application and the first part has a bunch of subparts which I'll explain in more detail in a moment. The application process for these programs usually consists of three components. There's what's called a primary application, which is a common application that goes out to all the schools that you're applying to. Individual schools will then follow up oftentimes with what's called a secondary or sometimes a supplemental application. This is usually done after the primary application is received, but in some instances, like with dental schools, students are being asked to submit a so-called um, supplemental application to each individual school at the time they submit their primary application. And then most of these programs have a, a, an interview component to their process as well. Although some programs simply rely on the primary and the secondary to make offers. That's, that's more common in, in schools like physical therapy schools, for example. Within that primary application, there's typically six components. Students have to submit their transcripts from every institution they've attended. They have to submit an, an entrance exam score oftentimes like the MCAT or the DAT exam. They're given space to describe the things that they've done along the way. They're given space to describe themselves and their personal statement. Many of these application systems now have an optional essay where students can write more about overcoming a disadvantage status. And I'll talk more about that when we get to number five. And then finally, um, students are asked to submit a number of letters of recommendation. And so we're gonna talk about each one of these pieces in more detail. We'll talk about the first two of them together simply because uh, schools look at them together. Uh, and we encourage students to consider them together when they're trying to gauge their readiness or their competitiveness. Uh, although our sense is that these numbers don't necessarily mean as much in terms of their overall success rate 
as students think that they sometimes do. But we can look at a little bit of data, right? Um, here's a graph from UW Med School uh, showing uh, the class of 19 and how they got in based on their MCAT scores and their GPAs. And you can see from this graphic that there was a pretty significant spread in terms of both of those numbers. And that students got in with surprisingly low GPAs in some cases. Um, oftentimes those students had above average MCAT scores, not surprisingly. That speaks to the importance of the MCAT score as compared to the GPA in predicting success in a program like medical school. Another way that schools will sometimes look at these two numbers together is by considering them uh, as a, whether they exceed a threshold or not, right? And so you can see here from the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine at Wazoo, they want to see a combination of these two numbers that meets one of these three criteria. Uh, and I'm struck by how low that 2.6 number is in that third criteria in conjunction with the 61st percentile number. That's not really that high. That's like a 5.10 on the MCAT. So the takeaway from the, some of this data is that maybe your grades and MCAT scores don't need to be as high as you think that they do. They just have to be above a certain threshold. And obviously that threshold will depend on the school you're applying to. Some schools are very transparent about that, like both UW and Wazoo, to their credit. Other schools are less transparent about that. Many students are concerned about going to a really hard university like UW and how that's going to affect their competitiveness in getting into programs like this. And what I like to point out in that situation, as shown by this data from the Association of Medical Schools, so they, they, they provide information to UW advisors on how our students do in the application process, you can see in that purple box that students consistently over time from UW who are applying to med school apply with significantly lower GPAs by about a tenth of a point. But you can see by the data in the gold box that UW students are also accepted to med schools with significantly lower GPAs by about a tenth of a point. So this tells me a couple of things. Number one, it tells me, as you can see from this data, UW students tend to uh, apply with average MCAT scores and are accepted with higher than average MCAT scores. It also helps me understand that, you know, maybe the grades don't matter as much as students think that they do in the course of the application process. And I'm happy to discuss all this data with you if you'd like to do a deeper dive into that through an appointment. Let's move on to talk about the activity descriptions. That's a section of the application where students can write about all different kinds of things they've been engaged in. And you can see from the drop down menu in the screenshot uh, on your screen that schools are really interested in hearing about all of the kinds of things you've been involved in. And that includes clinical experiences as well as um, uh, other kinds of non-clinical volunteering, paid employment, research, hobbies, extracurriculars, artistic endeavors. They want to know about all of those things. And we'll talk about a couple of those briefly here before we proceed. When we talk with students about how to think about their professional facing time and their patient facing time, we encourage them to really reflect on what they learned from those experiences. Professional facing time like shadowing or working as a scribe or watching a family member do the profession is really helpful at confirming that you have an interest in the profession. And it's really helpful at confirming that you understand the profession, but it's not really helpful at confirming that you're gonna be good at the profession, that you have the skills that you need. So we encourage students to complement that professional facing time with what we call patient facing time, uh, which is really where they're interacting directly with patients. And that's oftentimes through volunteering and for some students, that's in, that includes paid employment as a certified nursing assistant, EMT, phlebotomist, or maybe a pharmacy technician. This type of work helps students to confirm that they've got the bedside manner or the chair side manner or the table side manner that they're gonna to need to be successful in a career in medicine or dentistry or physical therapy. Leadership is also a quality that's very important to health professional schools. Uh, and you can see from this word cloud on your screen that uh, I put together with a group of students who are working on their applications last year, um, a lot of the same kinds of themes emerge when you talk about what leadership looks like in different healthcare professions. Empathy, communication, problem solving, not surprisingly, are skills that are required for leaders in lots of different professions. What I also encourage students to consider is what are the unique leadership skills that people who are in their profession need as compared to people in other health professions? And that can help them do a deeper dive into what leadership looks like and how they can demonstrate that they have that. Notice also, if I go back to that drop-down menu, leadership not listed elsewhere is one of the categories that's specifically called out and encourage students to really shine a bright light on their leadership experiences in their application. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, artistic endeavors and hobbies are very uh, interesting and important in this process. They demonstrate self-care, 
uh, and how you stay connected and how you regenerate and how you handle stress. And I think all of those things are of great interest to health professional schools, given that they understand and appreciate the rigor of the program as well as the rigor of the profession. So I always encourage students to, to definitely explore those and how, uh, how they help them take care of themselves in their application. Moving on to the personal statement, that's really an area where we encourage students to explore other questions uh, that are beyond just the things that they've done because most students have done, for the most part, more or less the same things along the way. So the personal statement's really a place where you can talk about your motivation for a career in this field, why you're pursuing a career in medicine, for example, and not a career in another health profession or not a career in research, for example. It's also a place where you could talk a little bit more about your long-term goals not that schools have any expectation that you've got this all figured out. And it's also a place to write about other parts of uh, where your passion for this job is coming from besides just the things that they, you've done along the way. Because of course, they've already given you a place to write about those things elsewhere in the application, which is why I encourage students to try to answer other questions about themselves in their personal statement, which aren't part of what they've done along the way. As I mentioned earlier, many application systems also include an optional essay where students are uh, given the opportunity to put uh, uh, an obstacle they might have faced along the way into some context if that's relevant to their application. This could include um, social disadvantages along the way, educational or financial disadvantages. So for example, if a student has had to work while they were in school to help pay for their way and that necessarily limited the amount of time they were able to spend on their coursework or on gaining clinical experience or doing volunteer work or undergraduate research. This is certainly a place where students can write about that. Uh, many students are leery of using this essay. They are not sure if what they want to write about will count as disadvantaged. And again, if that's something that's on your mind, we encourage you to make an appointment with the coach to describe your situation in more detail. We can work with you and help you identify the parts of your story that are gonna help them understand not only the obstacles that you've gotten over along the way, but also the skills that you've gained from them that are gonna make you a great health professional someday. And, and I found that the students who have overcome most obstacles are oftentimes the ones that are least uh, willing to use this box because they feel like nobody else, uh, well, they feel like everybody else has really had to overcome similar obstacles along the way. And I try to emphasize to them that that's usually not the case, right? So again, if you're, if you're wondering about what you might write there, please feel free to make an appointment with a coach and we can talk about it further. And finally, the last piece of the primary application are the letters of recommendation. Um, different schools uh, vary in terms of how many letters they want and from whom. Uh, many schools want to see three letters, two from science professors and one from a non-science professor, whereas other schools are much more flexible and will let you submit between three and six letters from anybody you want. And we always encourage students to take advantage of that flexibility when schools provide it in terms of who those letters come from, uh, because we recognize that it's very difficult to get great letters from professors at the University of Washington, given the large class size. And we also recognize that um, oftentimes it's those bosses or those PIs of those research labs that have really gotten to know you better and can really speak to the qualities that would make you a great doctor or dentist or pharmacist someday. These letters should ideally reinforce what you say about yourself or complement what you say about yourself and put some of your activities or your grades or your research experience into some context, right? So you ideally wanna be very thoughtful and explicit about what these people write about you in these letters. And the nice thing is, is that the associations uh, for each of these professions provide some clues as to what they're looking for. This is a screenshot from a two-page brochure that the AAMC provides to prospective pre-med students to provide to their letter writers. Uh, and they would appreciate it if your letter writer could speak to these qualities because these are the qualities that they think are going to be uh, most necessary for success in med school. So this is about as close to uh, a recipe for a successful application as you're gonna find. We encourage students to reflect on how they've demonstrated these core competencies in the things they've done. And we encourage them to write about them in their own activities descriptions, as well as be very explicit with their letter writers about which of these they want the letter writers to emphasize. And that's gonna help your letter writers help you have letters that work as hard for you as they need to. Let's move on to the secondary application phase. This is a, a phase where students actually have an opportunity to speak directly to the schools they've applied to. Schools will typically send you a set of essay questions shortly after you submit your primary application. Uh, and those questions fall into a couple of common categories. Oftentimes there are questions in there about adversity, wanting to know about challenges you've overcome or failures that you faced along the way. Oftentimes there are questions about diversity, uh, wanting to know how you're going to contribute to the diversity of their cohort of students 
or wanting you to know that diversity is very important to them and they want to know what it means for you. And then oftentimes schools will, will want to know why you want to go to their school. And we encourage students to be very nuanced and explicit about that. In fact, we encourage students to try to take every opportunity in those secondary application essays to answer that university question and to show schools why they'd be such a good fit and vice versa, because we think that's how students maximize their chances of getting interviews. Schools can't interview everyone they want to based on uh, just their grades and MCAT scores. So they have to make some tough choices about who they invite for interviews. And we think based on what we hear from people who work at these schools, we think that uh, what they're looking for is people who really want to go to that school. And so we encourage students to be very thoughtful about how they demonstrate that. And then finally, as I mentioned a moment ago, the last phase is an interview phase, uh, which will be uh, in, in one of two forms. Oftentimes, it's we're meeting with a committee of professors and alumni uh, and staff from the school, as you see in the picture on the left. Um, many schools nowadays use something called a multiple mini interview format or an MMI. Uh, and that's where students rotate through stations where they interact with one member of the admissions committee at each station for a very short amount of time, maybe nine minutes or so. Uh, it's helpful to learn more about how schools structure their interviews, to learn more about how best to prepare. We also encourage students to think about what is it that they want, what kind of messages do they want to be sending in the course of that interview in terms of their professionalism, as well as their, their empathy and their maturity which are qualities that med schools and dental schools and, and pharmacy schools are obviously looking for in an interview. Um, and so we work with students on how to really put themselves their best foot forward, regardless of the uh, interview format. And we're happy to work with you on that particular part of the application, if that's a cause of concern for you, or if you have a lot of anxiety about that, because it can certainly feel very uh, stressful. Finally, I just want to close by uh, inviting you to take advantage of other resources that we provide in this realm. We have a whole bunch of short videos on our website, including a whole series on each piece of the application process where you can learn more about how to write about your clinical experience or your research experience or your leadership experience. You're also encouraged to enroll in our online application seminar. We're offering it this quarter and there's still plenty of room. That's a Gen Studies 297 class and I'm happy to provide you a link to do so. Uh, we let alumni, um, just uh, uh, enroll, uh, just drop in as needed. They don't have to be enrolled in that class. And so if you're an alum on the webinar today and you'd like to get access, please do send me an email. We also encourage you to schedule a virtual appointment or a virtual drop-in. We're gonna be open remotely throughout the spring and summer, uh, working with students on their applications. Um, and if, you, if you'd like to schedule an appointment with one of us to go over any of your application materials, you are welcome to do so. Um, and then finally, if you have any questions after this workshop, you're always welcome just to email prehealth at uw.edu. Notice that there are no vowels in the health part in uh, that email address. It's just preholz at uw.edu. Um, I'm going to pause just for a moment, um, and then I'm happy to stick around and take some additional questions if people would like to do so. Um, give me one minute. I'm just going to end the broadcast. Okay, somebody wanted to know about the course number for the, um, for the seminar. Let me pull that up. It's a Gen Studies 297. I want to say the section number is F. Um, and I could pull a flyer up on my screen, but um, let's, go with, let's go with that. If you have other questions, please feel free to put them in the question and answer box. And if you feel comfortable and you'd rather just uh, turn on your microphone, uh, or start your video camera, you're certainly welcome to do that and just ask the question in person. This part will not be recorded uh, and will not be broadcast out, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, a question came in from the chat box. Do you have any tips about staying organized during the application process? Um, that's a great question. I think, you know, what I, and I'll go back to, um, I'll just go ahead and, and, and share my screen again, because I think going back to that timeline that we provided at the beginning was instructive. Um, if you go, if you think about this process, it's really a marathon and not a sprint, right? And I think a lot of students underestimate the amount of time that this process is going to take them. So here's that slide. Um, what I always encourage students to be thinking about 
is, you know, what has to be happening right now, what is urgent and what is important and understanding how those two things might be different. I think that's really important. Um, I think the piece that students typically will um, uh, take their eye off the ball is on um, working with those letter writers to make sure that those don't delay, that the delay in submitting those letters doesn't delay the processing of their application. And that takes a lot of, uh, uh, of relationship care and feeding. Um, and then I think a lot of students underestimate the amount of time that the application itself is going to take, the amount of time it'll take to enter in all their coursework, or the amount of time that writing a really powerful personal statement can take. And so I always encourage students to make sure they block in as much time for the application itself um, as they've done for, say, preparing for the MCAT. And again, we're happy to work with you on a, on a timeline for that that really fits your schedule, keeping in mind that for many students nowadays, this is going to involve multiple gap years, and we want to really normalize the fact that, that it's okay to not take the MCAT until after you graduate if you don't have time, because you really want to do well in the MCAT the first time you take it. Okay, let's move on. I was previously working at a lab, and I wanted to ask for a letter of recommendation now so that when they write my letter, it's more recent. However, I'm not sure how appropriate it is to ask them for a letter of recommendation during this time. Now, I'm not sure if you meant during this time in terms of like they're very busy with COVID-19 research, or if you meant that um, since you don't need the letter right now, you shouldn't ask for it now. I'm gonna assume it's the latter and let's talk about that. It's always great to have them write the letter while you and your relationship with them and those qualities that you've demonstrated are fresh in their mind. And then have them save that letter somewhere in the cloud. Um, hopefully not on a laptop that they're going to lose or something like that. Um, there's also a company called Interfolio where you can buy a subscription to the company and you can have your letter writers upload those letters to an Interfolio account, which you can then later release to these associations, keeping in mind that you never get to see the letters. They just hold them for you. But uh, health professional schools want those letters dated within about a year of when you apply. And so even if you did that, you'd probably have to have that person go back in and refresh that letter in the year in which you're planning to apply. So. That is a service that might be helpful, but isn't necessary. I think it's always good to have them at least start the letter now, draft a letter, which they can always revise at a later time. Somebody asked if the application process is the same for pharmacy school at UW and elsewhere. It is a similar process. I think the timelines are a little bit different. My sense is the pharmacy app opens up a little bit later in the summer. So it's not in June or late May, but it's actually in July but they're on a similar timeline and it is a similar process where they go through primaries, secondaries, and then the uh, interviews. Um, can we not read our letters of recommendation? No, you cannot. That's a good question. And that's really how they preserve the, the integrity of those letters. Um, when you create an application profile, you tell the application system to send your letter writer an email with a link for them to upload their letter directly to your application and you never get to see it. And that's very much intentional because they don't want, they don't want to worry if you've seen it and they don't want letter writers to pull their punches if they're worried that you're going to see it. And that's why they preserve the integrity of the process by not letting you see those letters. Uh, how has the application process, how is the application process affected by COVID? That's a great question. As I said earlier, you know, we're updating students as we get updates. Um, there are some sort of short-term things that we're tracking. The biggest one right now is um, that many of the MCAT uh, and other standardized test dates this spring and this summer have been canceled. And so students who were hoping to take those tests right before applying um, may not be able to do so uh, until later in the fall. And it looks like schools are going to be very accommodating with that. They're going to move those applications forward without a score, which I, I understand is something that is sometimes done, but is probably going to be done much more commonly this cycle. Um, the other area where I think you're going to see some changes is going to be in the interview stage, in the interview process, which you know typically doesn't start until September or October. But it's conceivable that interviews might be all remote this year, or in many cases, schools might go to a remote interview model. Um, and so we'll be working as coaches with students throughout the summer on how to put their best foot forward in virtual interviews. And we'd be happy to talk with you more about the specific nuances of doing virtual interviews and what you might want to have in mind as you're preparing for those. So we'd be happy to work with you on that as well. How did you, how do you find out about medical schools and how they differ and what their preferences are for the kinds of students they attract, et cetera? That's a great question. That's a really big question. 
I always encourage students to be very thoughtful about what they're looking for in a med school. Um, there's a great resource on the website of the triple of the AAMC, um, and it's called 35 Questions I Wish I Had Asked. So if you put that into a search bar, uh, you can find that. You can also email me and I'd be happy to send you a link to that. Um, that is um, a resource which I think is really helpful at expanding your criteria for what is important to you in a school and what you're really looking for. Um, and I would encourage you to look at that list and, and, and go beyond just MCATs and GPAs and location to really think more about what kind of learning environments are important to you, uh, what kinds of support services you're going to be looking for and needing. Um, does this school really have uh, familiarity or, 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 or expertise in the types of medicine I think I might want to practice someday? Those are all things to be thinking about. And those are all things that will help you rank a list of schools, but also then help you make the case to that school in that secondary and in that um, uh, interview that you um, are really a good fit with them and vice versa. Uh, and, and that's, that's really going to be a very, uh, you know, personal conversation. And we'd be happy to chat with you more about that. Um, okay. Is it okay to ask for a letter of rec from a professor that doesn't know you personally, but you did well in their class? That's a good question. Um, I think for me, I think the answer would really be, um, it depends on if you think you demonstrated any of the qualities that schools are going to be looking for. Um, and if you have, great. Um, and that could include perseverance, or maybe you went to their office hours a lot. Um, but it's not really about your grade in the class, I think is an important thing to note. Uh, it's really more about um, what kinds of qualities you demonstrated, whether that was by taking the leadership role in a group project, or whether that was by you know, doing poorly on the first midterm, but then coming to office hours and really working hard at adjusting your study style, your test prep style to do better. You know, honestly, that is going to be a much more compelling letter. And when I've talked to professors about this, I've asked them if, you know, in their minds, is it critical that a student got a good grade to get a, to get a good letter? And, and, and oftentimes the answer is no. So I wouldn't let that hold you back. Um, but I also wouldn't necessarily rely on a professor who I, doesn't, who I don't know very well to write me a strong letter, which is why we always encourage students to ask for a strong, positive letter. That gives the person the opportunity to say no but it also gives them the opportunity to say, I could write you a letter, but it's not going to be a strong letter. Okay, got time for just a couple more questions. Let me see here what's come in on the list. Um, will UW still be holding the MCAT prep classes with the COVID situation going on? And if they are, would you recommend that students take the class to prep for the MCAT? I think this student is referring to the MCAT prep course that's offered through the Instructional Center on campus. Um, we, that's the only class that we uh, uh, encourage students to consider um, because we do not have any partnerships with any of the commercial test prep companies. Um, I'm personally a big fan of that program. The, 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 the professor who, who leads that program is a physics professor who is very, very good at taking standardized tests and thinking about how standardized tests work. Um, and I would certainly encourage you to explore it further. My sense is it is going to be offered, but it is probably moving into a remote format. Um, but it is something that you should check out. So if you just, if you search uh, UW IC MCAT prep, it'll take you right to their page. And if you can't find it, just send me an email and I'd be happy to direct you to them. Um, does CNA count as clinical hours if you didn't work in the hospital? Sure. If you worked in a nursing home or assisted living situation, you still learned a lot about patient care that's going to be relevant to that future career. The onus is on you to make it relevant. The onus is on you to describe or, 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 to reflect on what you learned. Um, but if you can do that, uh, then yes, it certainly counts. And of course, we can help you make it count. That's what we do when we work with students on their applications, uh, is help them reflect on what they did and what they learned and how that's going to make them great uh, at whatever it is that they're applying for. So with that, uh, I'm going to say goodbye and encourage you again, uh, if you have additional questions, to make an appointment. Or if, it's, uh, uh, if you'd uh, like to um, take a look at some of those videos and then send us some questions through email, you can certainly do that as well. Thanks for coming today and have a great afternoon.